Hi, everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I'm the program specialist here at Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Zoom program, Michigan Beer, A Heady History. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on the RHPL website shortly after. For the duration of tonight's program, the audience will remain muted and unable to unmute themselves, as well as with their cameras off and unable to turn them on. There will be a Q&A afterwards in which the audience can ask questions via Zoom's chat feature, and I will present them as a moderator for the speaker to answer. I will leave a message in the chat box around the start of the Q&A so everyone will know where to find it. We'd also like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is Bulgaria and Balkan Wanderings, which will be an in-person event on Thursday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Patty Smith. Thank you, Amalia. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rochester Hills Public Library. Um, I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. And there we are. So um, thanks again for joining us. Um, as you can see, I have uh, written, well, as we'll talk about throughout this presentation, I have written a book about Michigan beer history. And so oftentimes um, people have asked me, and this is like a reasonable question, who are you and how did you really get to write this book? Um, well, really quick, I am by day, by profession, I am a special ed teacher, high school teacher, um, specializing in math geometry, algebra two, algebra, all that fun stuff. Uh, but kind of on the side, I guess you'd say, I've been writing about history and beer for over a decade each. Um, I started writing, I live in Ann Arbor. I started writing about local Ann Arbor history about 2011, 2012. And that sort of culminated, it led me to write my first book on downtown Ann Arbor. And then my second book about the food co-op in Ann Arbor and its history. And then my third book about the greater Ann Arbor area history. I've been writing about beer about the same amount of time, um, just doing reviews of different brew pubs, beer reviews, festival reviews, all that stuff. And I decided to combine the things that I really like and am passionate about beer history and the state of Michigan. So I put all of this together uh, to my publisher, I stayed in touch with my editor, and um, about the end of 2019, I was like, hey, John, what do you think of this? And he's like, yeah, 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 but you need a proposal. And just real quick, if, if you do a nonfiction book, you don't write it first. You do a proposal, pretty lengthy, saying here's why you should publish my book, and then they say yes or no. So finally got that together. I submitted it to him um, right about March uh, 9th, 10th of 2020 which as we know was uh <laughs> something was happening around that time which of course was stuff was shutting down for the pandemic so i call this my pandemic book i was not able to go around as i had planned to spend the summer of 2020 going around to uh, libraries and brew pubs and historical societies um but i was able to still get a really a book that I'm really proud of, talking about history in Michigan. Uh, we're going to start a little bit broader. We're going to talk a little bit about the world history of beer. Where does it come from? Um, why do we enjoy it? What is some history there? Talk a little bit about American history of beer. Then we'll talk about local history, um, Michigan, Detroit, and then Macomb County, and uh, finally Oakland County. So just real quick, this is a uh, carving that I really like. This was about 4,000 BCE, ancient Sumerians enjoying beer with reeds used as straws. And the reason I like this is because it shows beer is a communal beverage, which it still is. Many people, enjoy, including myself, really enjoy going to the brew pub, sharing a beer with friends. I was just at Wolverine in Ann Arbor on Sunday, me and my husband, and 
just chatted up random people at the bar. And that's one of, I think, one of the joys of enjoying this beverage in moderation as they did 6,000 years ago. So right leads to the question, who invented beer? And the reality is we really don't know. There's nothing written down that says, well, on this day, I left grains out and they fermented and oh my gosh, the yeast and the, you know, nothing like that. Um, there is this story of like, someone left bread and it rained and yeast and like the village idiot was like walking and was like, yeah, sure. And drank and then said, this is great. Let's, what is this? Might've happened. They might've said, you know, let's try this. Let's, let's put some water. We don't know. Um, we do know it's been around for at least 6,000 years. I have read uh, books and articles that say 7,000, 9,000 years. Suffice it to say, a very long time. So we don't exactly know who the first person was to discover this, but we do know our friends, the Mesopotamians, 6,000 years ago, were drinking beer. Did it taste like ours? Probably not. They did use roasted and toasted grain like we do. No mention of hops. We'll get to hops in a few thousand years. Um, they did, there are records of using a syrup made of dates, which I'm guessing would have sweetened it up a bit. Um, what did it look like? Was it that nice? Probably not. Uh, reports say it probably tasted and looked a lot like porridge. So next time you're eating your oatmeal, you know, think about, hey, beer, oatmeal, you know, don't knock it. Um, just some other fun things. We know that there were beer recipes written on Babylonian tablets. We found about a couple dozen recipes just calling for different types of adjuncts, different types of grains, which I think is pretty impressive for like 4300 BCE to actually have recipes for beer. So, and they've survived to be unearthed by people much smarter than me. Um, Sumerians actually made, had a goddess of beer, Ninkazi. They wrote hymns to her and those have been unearthed and found. And I hope that one day I find out I am her reincarnated. I think that'd be really cool. I'd be like, yeah, I knew it. That's cool. Um, we do know, and you might've heard, beer has been used as payment for people for thousands of years. Um, I guess you'd call them like pay stubs have been found uh, indicating that the workers got two liters of beer per day and management and priests got five. So I don't know if that's fair, but uh, we do know people have been paid farmhands, laborers. That was currency back then. Um, also medicinal purposes. I have read into this. I've thought about it a lot. And when I'm doing a live presentation, I'll usually say, hey, why do you think beer might've been prescribed like medicine? And usually one of the responses is, it makes you feel good. And that is absolutely true. Um, also, back in the day, even not that long ago, water was not the safest drink. If you lived near a stream or a lake, it might've been okay. But for the most part, um, people bathed in animal waste and people waste all in kind of the same location. Unless, like I said, some people were lucky enough to live near a nice pristine stream, but most weren't. And beer just happened to be safer. We also know that Ramses III sacrificed, literally poured one out for the little G gods as a sacrifice to the tune of about 10,000 gallons sacrificed. And it's not clear if that was during his reign, like per year, but that's a lot of beer to uh, be pouring out and sacrificing. <laughs> Going ahead a little bit to our common era, uh, beer comes to Europe, the European continent, and when I say everyone loves it, I mean everyone loves it. A children drank it that was a low alcohol for them, and I actually was on Reddit of all places, and I mentioned this book, and someone said, and I mentioned this, you know, low alcohol, and someone's like, oh yeah, I live in England, and we still make like, you know, half percent, one percent beer for kids, so different, different thing. Most brewers back in the day were women. I usually will throw this question out to people. And a lot of people say, oh, monks were like the first brewers. That's not untrue. They were very early brewers, but the first 
brewers that have been credited in history are women. And that is just because it was made in the home. This was part of what you did as your daily chores. You made your bread, you know, you had your cheese, your, you know, your meat, you were doing whatever with, um, and beer was part of it. And if you are a beer a lover, you may have, and even if not, you may have had farmhand style ale, which is a low alcohol beer, usually about 4%. And it comes from back in history when women made beer and it was part of the farmhands package. It wasn't their only pay, they got pay, but that was part of the thing. You had lunch and you had a low alcohol beer. You don't want like a 10% stout, right? You don't want them passing out. You want a nice, nice, easy drinking kind of lawnmower beer, we might call it today. And that's where that style comes from. Um, we finally hear about hops in about the 8th century. The earliest recording I could find was from 768 AD. There was a monastery in Bavaria that was brewing the monks, were brewing beer, and there was a nearby hop farm, and that farm actually tithed hops to these monks. Hops do a number of things. They add flavor. They also preserve the beer. Prior to hops being used, there was a style and still is called gruet. And that was, um, they used herbs and spices to kind of, mostly spices, I guess, to kind of um, preserve the beer and make it last longer. It's not bad. I've had it. Um, I mean, it's kind of spicy. It's, it's not horrible. Um, hops do add a distinctly different flavor. Um, if you're an India Pale Ale fan, IPA fan, those tend to be hoppier. And those actually, that beer style started when beer had to go from England to India and it was going bad. And then people just started putting in hops and there you go, it preserved it. Um, the spot where this monastery was in Bavaria actually is now home to that plot of land, now has a brewery on it and has had a brewery there for almost a thousand years. Weihen Stefan is the oldest continuously operating brewery in the world. It's in Germany, probably no surprise in Bavaria. Um, as an American, this blows my mind that something is almost a thousand years old through all the wars, all the conquests, everything that happened in Germany, it is still going. Um, you can buy their beer. They do sell lager, some other lager they do bottle. It's fine. I'm sure it's much better fresh off the tap. I'd like to go one day. Someone actually in at a presentation a couple months ago is going to Germany and she's going to go there. And I'm like, oh my God, like send me a picture. Uh, 1516, our German friends. I'm German. My family's German. Um, Germans take beer very seriously. They passed a law that is still on the books. The 1516 Beer Purity Law, uh, what was happening in, in Europe, in Germany, is people were making liquid stuff and selling it as beer. If you're a brewer, uh, if you're a professional, amateur, home brewer, you know that when you have that pot, that stock pot, that huge mash ton, you can kind of mash whatever you'd like to, within reason, um, into the grain. So just something I can throw out for at the end of the presentation. I like to ask people, you know, what is the most unusual beer you've drank? Um, for me, it's Right Brain's Asparagus beer. I, it's got a cute name, but I can't remember it. Um, excuse me. It's the only beer I've ever actually not been able to drink because it was just too much. Um, but I have friends who love it and I applaud Right Brain for, for going out on a limb like that. Um, but you can put asparagus in the mash. Um, they also, Right Brain makes a wonderful cherry pie beer with actual cherry pies in the mash. They make Girl Scout cookie. I've had my friend make salsa beer, which is really good. He also makes um, red hot beer. So you can put like a variety of adjuncts. But back then in the 1500s and before, they were putting stuff like wormwood and hay and dandelions and just wild like things growing from the ground. Um, even like crab, like the like crab was in there. And Germans like, no, you know what? It, you can sell that, but it's not beer. So if you're going to call it beer, we're going to give you three ingredients. You can use water, malted barley, malted grain, and hops. Those three things. Anything else, it's not beer. Okay. 
The fourth ingredient, of course, is yeast. They didn't know what it was back then. Once we kind of figured that out, they added that. So there's four ingredients under this purity law. There are many breweries worldwide, including the United States, that uh, abide by that law. They only put four things in their beer, the water, grain, hops, and yeast. You can make thousands of different tasting beers. Um, otherwise, you can add what we call adjuncts, which would be like coffee and chocolate and asparagus and salsa or whatever else you might want to put in your beer. Um, the other kind of exciting thing that happened in the common era, lagers being discovered by accident in the 1600s. And just a quick little commercial on beers. Um, if you are a whiskey fan, you have your rye and your scotch and your bourbon. If you are a beer drinker, you have your lagers and your ales. Lagers that were discovered by accident, literally somebody brewed the beer, barreled it up, put it somewhere cold, and then was like, oh my God, oh, forgot about this drank it and it was delicious and there boom born maybe not quite like that but boom we got lager um if you've had a pilsner if you've had oktoberfest box you have had a lager they tend to be crisper kind of cleaner served cold with like a kind of a fizzy head if you drink budweiser or pabst or labat those are lagers just simple terms certain particular kind of yeast fermented at a colder temperature, longer periods of time. More commonly, home brewers, brew pubs make ales, um, and they are shorter fermentation, warmer temperatures. When I home brewed, you know, I don't have a cave, so I made ale. Um, we could make an ale tonight, and in a couple weeks, it'll be fermented. We can drink it. If you get a porter, IPA, brown, a stout, Hefeweizen, all those are ales doesn't, and they tend to be like a little chewier, they say, a little maltier, heavier, doesn't matter. Not really. I mean, drink what you like. I really, um, I've had excellent lagers. I've had excellent ales and it really, it's, it's what you like. So if you drink Pabst, I had a guy in Adrian presentation stood up and he's like, I got to confess to you people, Pabst is my favorite beer. And I was like, I think he thought we were going to like, you know, throw stuff at him. I'm like, oh, that's fine. You know, here, <laughs> whatever, drink whatever. <laughs> um, so let's jump from Europe a little closer to home here in America. Um, of course, first peoples, Amer Native Americans were here. They were brewing. They used what they had. They had corn. Um, instead of the date syrup that our way ancients used, they might have used black birch sap. What did it taste like? Again, you'd have to kind of make up a recipe and brew it yourself, I guess. Even then it's gonna be different. Um, I don't think it would taste necessarily like what we were used to, um, but you used what you had. They had corn, some had maize, um, agave, rye, wheat, whatever you have is what you used. We know that colonists were brewing as early as 1587. And we know that because someone wrote a letter. There was someone in what is now Virginia tried to brew, didn't quite work out. And the reason we know this is that person wrote a letter back to family in England and said, please send beer. And that letter presumably went on a ship, sailed and beer came back. So we tried, you know, we, we tried, um, the West India Corporation, you might have heard of their tea. Um, they also opened a commercial brewery in New Amsterdam, New York City. Most of what I read said 1612, but then I saw a couple of things that said 1632. So 16, early 1600s, they opened a commercial brewery. Possibly those fine pilgrims you see drank there, um, but really most beer drinking took place in the home. It was still not really a commercial enterprise. Um, people weren't necessarily running out to restaurants like we might every day of the week. Uh, they were enjoying food and drink at home. Um, truly enjoyed by all. And I love to share these. I love old ads. This just shows you children drinking beer. In the upper left-hand corner from Milwaukee, a young child cries because her beer is falling off her platter. Next to her are children dancing and a beer bottle maple. 
as God intended. Um, blats, this is how the young mother and baby picked up with a case of blats in your home. Um, from our friends in France, there is showing us the baby of the beer drinking, breastfeeding mother, significantly happier than the baby of the non beer drinking mother. And welcome to people who just joined. What a slide to join on. <laughs> you picked the right time. <laughs> Oh, and the last ad there in the lower right hand corner, it's the family enjoying a beer after a hard day at work and school and around the house. Um, so on average, about 3% alcohol by volume in each beer. Um, your average like Labatt would be about like four or four and a half percent. Um, IPAs tend to be about like 7%. Stouts can be up to like nine times, 10%. So these were really low alcohol beers. They also made the small beers I mentioned earlier, like the half percent, one percent, specifically for the babies and the ladies. The ladies did not drink outside the home uh, at that time. It really wasn't till after prohibition that it became acceptable for women to be drinking in public. They did, they did, but they were not ladies. So, ooh. Um, the good stuff still came from England. We tried here in America. Uh, we did what we could. It really wasn't until these friends who I think really put America on the beer map. And that, of course, is Anheuser-Busch. You've probably heard of them. Still a big, big company from St. Louis. Father-in-law, son-in-law, uh, Eberhardt Anheuser and Adolphus Busch. They, uh, Anheuser was like 20 things. It was like a candle maker and a soap maker and like a cooper. And finally, he's like, yeah, okay, beer. Let's try that. Son-in-law joins the firm. Son-in-law has the brilliant idea of shipping the beer on this new thing called the railroad. Oh, and also let's stop and get ice along the way. Um, if you check out the book from the library or you buy it, um, getting ice back in the day was really a big undertaking. You had to literally had like hook up the horses and you had the big saw and then you had to get the tongs and get the ice cubes and so if you could have cold beer in the summer, you are probably going to sell a, a decent amount of beer. Um, their idea, Bush's idea was, well, let's stop at ice houses along the way, put the ice in the train car and ship this beer. And obviously it was a hit. Uh, as they went along on the railroad, they bought up ice houses, saloons, and then there was refrigeration on rail cars. And that just led to them being this huge, huge market share. And I really think they, they I don't necessarily love their beer, but I admire what they did um, and are still doing. So quick stop here, just an overall Michigan land. I like talking about people. Um, upper left-hand corner is a guy you might have heard of, Larry Bell, circa 1985, uh, started, he was one of what I call the, the new wave of brewers in the late 80s and 90s, um, opened a tap room in the 90s, and biggest, um, they, they did, they're not family owned anymore, they did sell, I think the whole, I think 100% of their shares, I'm not sure actually, but they did sell to a bigger conglomerate, um, I hear the beer is still good, so that's good. Um, good for him. Um, next to Larry is a little bit older guy there. That is Mr. Kern from Port Huron, enjoying his beer. As you see, he is double fisting and the dog just is looking at the beer so happily as my dog is over there. You can't see him. He uh, doesn't like it. If I like hold it out to him, it's really fun. He just makes this face. It's very cute. I would never give my dog beer. Don't, don't do that. It's bad. Um, I think the picture of the, the men that you see there, that is um, National Brewers from Grand Rapids. That is just really representative of so many pictures that I saw that are in the book where you have those barrels in the back. You have the men with full tankards of beer ready just to drink those mugs looking kind of happy you know it was probably you know smelly and hot but you know they're drinking beer and in the lower left is Menominee State Brewing Company and those are just uh, you know it's just that's how it was you you put the beer in the the cooper made the barrel you put the beer in the barrel and off it went in the horse and buggy a little bit more modern there in the lower left that's Gobel beer that's an old Packard Barrels have evolved and now we're driving a car. 
Above that, a truck, Frankenmuth. Obviously cannot have a beer book without Frankenmuth. I was just there yesterday, not at the brewery, but at the city. Um, Frankenmuth Brewery is credited with being the longest, oldest, continuously operating brewery in Michigan. There's a little gap uh, when there was a tornado and there was a little bit of an ownership change, but otherwise they have been going a few different names at the beginning, but they are, they have been around for well over a hundred years. Um, in the middle, there's a cocktail lounge from Detroit, some folks enjoying a local beer. And in the bottom right, uh, that is Erickson from Big Rapids. Again, that picture I just thought was representative of the brewers. They had the awesome mustaches. And then those were their locations. That was his saloon slash brewery. The saloon is in the front and the business is in the, so it's like party in the front, business in the back. And that was very, very common back in the 18, late 18 and 1900s. So more ads, as I said, I really love old timey ads. Grand Rapids Brewing Company, I think just had great ones. You see the two monks in heaven looking down with happiness at the beer, perhaps reminiscing of their days on earth and mucking around and drinking beer. Um, below that is uh, the Silver Foam, their flagship beer. A mother is giving her small children the beer as again, as God in nature intended, they're going to enjoy some Silver Foam. Um, there's old Michigan beer on top. And Pfeiffer's, we'll talk a little bit about Pfeiffer's, um, Conrad Pfeiffer, Detroit Brewer. That is a recipe book where, bless their heart, they have recipes and beers you might enjoy with those recipes. And they happen to be Pfeiffer beer, which I think is a coincidence. Um, I'm a car girl, so I put Cadillac beer. And then Goble Beer, another Detroit brewery, big Detroit brewery. Um, that was their pre World War II insignia became problematic in World War II, and they changed that immediately upon being like, oh, no good. Um, so those are, I imagine, like uh, collector's items. They switched to the rooster after that. So just really quick talk about some early Detroit brewers in the city before it was a city, when it was a fort and ribbon farms and Cadillac there was a guy named Joseph Parent. Cadillac arrived about 1701, well, in 1701-ish, and uh, brought over Mr. Parent about two years later for the sole intent and purpose to brew beer. Joseph Parent was kind of had a monopoly in those early days because Cadillac apparently was pretty like, you know, farm your land, whatever, whatever. A few things you can't compete with me. And one of the things was, you're not making the beer. This guy's making the beer. So Detroit has had a brewer brewery since the beginning. Um, what did it taste like? What did he use? That is lost to history. It might have been delicious. I don't know. Um, but uh, Joseph did it. He brewed until about 1706 when he passed away. Um, there was also like hard cider being made. And I'm sure there were spirits being distilled. People have kind of always drank. So they were doing something. Um, they were making ales up until about 1848 when Frederick Elms arrived from Germany with loggers. And he introduced Detroit to loggers circa 1848. Germans almost exclusively brewed loggers. They saw it as the superior technique kind of they looked at ales like, oh, anyone can do an ale. You need German precision to do a lager. And that's where it came from Germany. Thomas Owens, commercial brewer, one of the first, that wonderful building that you see on the screen, it was known as the Old Mansion House. And that was um, at Griswold and Atwater Streets. Uh, it's now like part of the riverfront, but Thomas Owens Brewery was like around the corner and he stored his beer there. The reason I know this is I found an article about something that happened at the old mansion house in the late 1800s. And that is there was a fire. And if you pay attention to history, as I do, and you probably do too, there's always a fire. Stuff always burns down. Mansion house didn't totally burn down, but it caught fire and it caused the barrels to explode or leak or something such that there was beer running out of the room, down the stairs, to the plank sidewalk, and to the muddy street, full of horse 
muck and whatever else. Um, the reason I know this is there was a newspaper man at a nearby saloon, saw this whole debacle, grabbed a pen or whatever, and ran to the newspaper office and either wrote or banged out an article uh, talking about how there's free beer at Griswold and Atwater. So grab your mug and come down. And you know that he, you know, someone did like, oh, it's free beer. And then, well, so, you know, they did. Um, so just some other early brewers I want to make note of. When I envisioned this book, when I did my proposal, I really wanted to find stories buried in the archives, um, stories of Native Americans, African Americans, women, the stories you, you know, may not hear, and I'm sure they're there. I just didn't have access to them because of the pandemic. I was able to find a couple stories of women in the business. Now, I want to say again, this was not a woman's business at all. Women did not, ladies did not drink in public. Women were not on the floor of the brewery, but a couple of them ended up in the business. Eliza Greaser's husband had a home brewery. It was like they lived in the back was the brewing where the brewing took place and he died. Um, and she and either a brother or brother-in-law took over and she added, she tripled the output and added a saloon to the front. And she worked in the saloon. Again, not uncommon for the wives to kind of be like the serving in the saloon. I mean, that's what Eliza did. And, they, and she and her family kept it running for over two decades, which I think is really cool. Like this kind of small home operation, but they were able to make a living of it. Again, 1860s, not common at all for women. Um, another woman involved was Anna Cool. Her husband, Anton, had a commercial. He had his own commercial building. Um, this poor guy, I memorized his obituary because um, it was like 1874 and he died a million ways to die in old Detroit. And he died, poor guy, quote, uh, by cause of defective sidewalk under repair by the city, which tells me our sidewalks and streets were just as crappy 150 years ago. And poor Anton falls. There's no like Jomana. There's no Lee Free, Figer, Call Sam. No. So she and her son take over and they run the commercial brewery. Again, she's not on the brewery floor, but she took over the business. And so maybe it was easy. Maybe there was nothing, or maybe it was really tough. Either way, I just kind of give it up to those women for truly being pioneers um, in this field. Um, obviously Stroh, huge, huge story from Detroit. I don't spend a ton of time on it. There's so many books and articles about the Stroh family. Um, some important things, you know, Bernhard Stroh, third generation brewmaster from Germany. He's the guy with the cool mustache there. That's his family. He comes here, moves into Catherine Street in Detroit. The house is gone now. It starts making Pilsner, literally goes door to door in the barrel, sells it to people, you know, right out the barrel. Obviously it's good, people like it. And he starts selling more to neighbors and friends, ultimately ends up um, buying some of the property you see on, in the right, I don't know if it's right or left for you, it's right for me, but um, so, that's the family home. They had a malting operation. They had grain storage. They had an ice house. They had um, a significant parcel of land and things were going awesome. 1870s, 1875, getting bigger and bigger. He dies in 1882. Fortunately, Bernhard Jr. was there, now fourth generation brewmaster, took over. He's the one who introduced the fire brewing, the copper kettles, the things you might remember from commercials back in the day. Uh, they're brewing and brewing. Prohibition hits. For them, it's, it's not hard to stay afloat. They have all this property. They have the labor. They have the facilities. So they just start making things like ice cream. You probably know. Um, they made near beer. They also made my favorite, I wish I had a can of this. It was malting syrup and it was like in a can and it said very clearly on the label for home baking only not to be used for brewing beer. And I'm positive everyone 
followed the law because no one drank in prohibition. Uh, 1933 repeal, they just start brewing beer. Things are going like gangbusters. They're buying up, you know, Goebel. They're buying all these places. On 1979, they buy the Park Davis complex. And within six years later, my April, I'm sorry, May 1st, 1985, it all stops. Um, again, there's a bunch of reasons for that. I don't really belabor it. Um, if you're interested, there are great books about it. Uh, one of the great granddaughters wrote like, you know, we lost a billion dollars. I'd be, I'd be not happy <laughs> if my great grandpa had a billion dollars and I'm sitting here, Ugh, not really, happy. but uh, good for her. So um, again, more about that. It was, it is being brewed. Um, it was brew Detroit doing it. It's not them anymore. I'm not sure who's brewing it. It is, um, supposedly the same recipe, although, um, many people, including my dad say it's absolutely not the same as it was in 1985. And I trust him. I didn't have, I was 13. So I was not drinking beer. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, just a few other big brewers in the Detroit city, Voigt, father, son, Carl and Edward come over from Germany. Carl, it landed in Wisconsin. Carl starts a brewery. Son Edward goes to brewing school uh, in the winter. I'm sorry, in the summer, actually. Spring and summer in the winter. He's kind of helping his dad get stuff together. And uh, then they come to Michigan. And Edward takes a few stops. He like captains a schooner in New York and like all these fun things. Finally comes to Detroit, joins his dad. Dad uh, he inherits the brewery, goes on to have a successful brewing career, does a really a lot of good works. Edward Voigt, if you, if you are familiar with the Grozeal Bridge, they love him. I did a presentation at the Historical Society last summer, and they love him to pieces. Did a lot of great things. He did the bridge. Um, he donated land for a park, for Voigt Park. He plotted the streets in um, a subdivision around Voight Park off Woodward. Like I said, donated land. He was an investor in the Edison Illuminating Company, which employed a young Henry Ford. Um, he also held one of the founders of the DIA, what became the DIA. So a lot of really good citizens in the brewing community. I have a little thing in the book about like how many were like aldermen and like mayor and just all these awesome, awesome things. Um, Nexus Pfeiffer mentioned him a little bit, the recipe book. Conrad Pfeiffer came from a scion. He was a scion of family, like old, rich family in Germany. Nevertheless, he comes to America where he kind of does any job he can. He's like, you know, machinist, a locksmith. Finally ends up brewing beer. Starts in 1902, opens up Pfeiffer's. He dies in 1911. And his wife and daughter actually took control of the operations of the brewery. And they ran it till Prohibition. After Prohibition, another Pfeiffer started, but it was not those people. It was not the wife and daughter. It was, it was different people. Um, and they really kind of blew up from there. Um, the fight Johnny Pfeiffer mascot you see was designed by Disney. And they lasted until about uh, late 50s. There was a big brewer strike in 1958 that's kind of blamed for a lot of brewers going under. I don't think that's necessarily fair. Um, but there are more than a few that kind of fizzled out in the late 50s, early 60s. Coppets, Conrad Coppets is a brewer, was a brewer. They got popular, really popular after Prohibition, obviously, after or during World War II, they had a Victory Beer series of labels on their bottles. Why? And then at the time, you couldn't can. So think about this. When we enter World War II, we're not that long out of repeal. Okay. Repeal is 33. We enter World War II in late 41. So per capita drinking was still kind of low. World War II. Oh my God. So the government does something I think is, is we need to mention, which is that they declare brewing brewers an essential business, which prior to 2020, know, whatever, but I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. So they stayed open. And then the brewers could be like, look at us, we're essential. We're paying our taxes. We're employing the people who you know aren't at war for whatever reason. Um, and it also gave the government, they took this opportunity. They said, well, you can't can, you have to bottle or keg. All right, cool. We, the only stuff we're gonna can, we're gonna requisition 15% of your output brewers can it and send it to the guys for their rations. So they're going to get the, you know, the M&Ms and the cigarettes and whatever else and canned beer. So 
that kind of helped hopefully made their days a little brighter. I hope because they were doing the most, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine how brave they were. And um, then when they came home, they had built up brand loyalty, which is a whole nother conversation. Um, they wanted, you know, what they had. And that helped some of the bigger brew pop breweries really kind of make their name. Coppets is another one that kind of fell apart late 50s, early 60s. Um, but they had a good run. A um, few other places, Kling, Peter Kling was trained as a cooper. He was a barrel maker. Um, he was an alderman in Detroit. He was the first president of the Detroit Brewers Association. His family was involved in Kling's, brew, the Peninsula brew, Brewing Company. His daughter was a bookkeeper. And his son, Kurt, was one of the managers. Kurt also had a little side hustle. He managed an amusement park in Detroit. And I wish it was still there. It sounds cool as heck. It was called Luna Park and later Electric Park. And it just had all these like kind of crazy sideshows. And uh, I've seen some pictures like roller coasters. Very cool. Very cool. But one of the more significant things I think about Peter Kling, um, he brewed. He was a professional brewer until he was 82 years old. Um, at the age of 87, he was reported to be the oldest brew, like living brewer in the country. The man lived to be 92, always of sound mind and body. And I'm like, you know what, if that isn't proof that beers keep you alive, Peter Kling, 92 years old, I will take it. Um, and uh, then there's Gobble Beer, which again... Sorry, my dog is barking at nothing outside our door. Um, Goble Beer, again, was another one that uh, was popular, kind of post-prohibition, and lasted until 1958. Again, that brewer strike got a lot of blame. I think it was a lot of things. It was, you know, competition, brand loyalty, increased um, people coming in, like, from Milwaukee, from Cincinnati, and from St. Louis. But nevertheless, uh, they were bought out by Stroh's. So let's take a quick jaunt into prohibition. Everything's going amazing. Everybody's brewing, drinking, having a great time. All of a sudden, well, not quite all of a sudden. So here's the thing about prohibition. We kind of always had a temperance movement in Michigan as elsewhere. Uh, you had people who were like, you know, it's a moral failing. I'm not going to drink. Some of them probably were like, it should be illegal. It's awful. But a lot of them were kind of like, yeah, it's a moral failing. Then you had your prohibitionists who were like, no, it should be illegal. No one should have it. A lot of kind of strange bedfellows. You had doctors who were seeing people die from alcohol poisoning. Alcohol was not regulated like it is now. You had women, Christian groups, temperance groups, a lot of women in these groups. And I can't blame them. Um, if you married a guy who drank away the paycheck, I might think, well, if we get rid of the alcohol, he won't. Do it. Did he still do it? Possibly. Maybe he found something else. I don't know. But your options were extremely limited. So I, I totally can, can see why they would support that. Um, the clergy got involved and there's more and more kind of whispers about prohibition. Michigan passes a local option law, which says municipalities have the option to go dry. So we kind of were like a little patchwork quilt where like Jackson went dry, then it went wet and then dry and then wet and then dry and dry. Um, like Livingston, Brighton went dry, Monroe, Lenaway went dry. Um, for a while, if you know Manchester and Washtenaw County, cute little town, but it's got like, you know, one kind of main street. And for a while, they were the wettest city in Michigan. They had six brewery, uh, bre yeah, breweries who knows how many saloons, um, uh, a distiller, at least one distiller. And they had like, they were like the hopping spot because Lenaway and Monroe were dry. So people would go to Manchester to drink. So good for them. Um, really what kind of turned the tide was World War I. Who are we fighting? We were fighting the Germans. Think of Germans and beer and schnapps. And it kind of became this like, oh, you know, alcohol, beer is not patriotic. You're putting money in the, their things. Um, lots of xenophobic campaigns. I know in Ann Arbor, the German hotel had to change its name to the American hotel. So kind of all those things happening. Um, whatever the case may be, Michigan went dry early. We went dry May 1st, 1918. The um, majority of those who could vote at that time uh, which was not me. Um, and I, in theory, African-American men, I don't know how easy it was or not, but they voted to go dry as a state 
May 1st, 1918, stuff like that picture of all that alcohol coming out of a building in Detroit. That did happen. Um, you did have your protesters. I love them. As you can see on the left, uh, John Q. Public, the veteran, the mus musician, all protesting. And this lady brings her cow saying, I can't give milk. The dry move stole my food. A reference, no doubt, to the fact that distillers and brewers did and still do give their grain to cows, to farmers to feed their animals. So I just, they're just a hardy bunch and I love them. Anyway, cooler heads all prevailed, 1933 repeal, awesome. The bad news is there were about 2000 like breweries before prohibition and about 200 were left af after. So clearly huge, huge, huge impact, not only locally, but nationally. So let's look at a couple local things. Um, just real quick, this just fascinated me. So in Dearborn, where I work, of course, Ford is everywhere. He still is, right? Um, Stroh's grandson, Edwin Stroh, 1933, he's been selling insurance, repeal 1933. He says, you know what? I think it's time to get into brewing like grandpa. So he gets a, he gets a license. He uh, gets land on Schaefer Road, goes to Albert Kahn, who's the guy on the right with the glasses and the little vest and the jaunty little uh, timepiece, little chain there. They're going to put together a 200,000 barrel brewery in Dearborn. Uh, now we need money. Okay, cool. So he puts together people like Fritz Goebel, that sound familiar, uh, James Werner, sound familiar, and uh, Edwin Albert Kahn, all these people, uh, Bernhard Stroh, his brother, the grandson, so like the fifth generation brewer, um, all are putting their money up. They go to the Walker facility, which you see that picture there over in Canada, and they talk to Harrison Walker, who likes the idea so much. He says, you know what? I'm not only going to get involved, I'm going to take over and we're going to have a brewery distillery there in Dearborn. So all this money, all this talent, and it never happens. Walker drops out uh, 1934. Two years later, another group headed by Edwin Stroh again forms and can't quite get the money. So the question is, well, what happened? Why did this not happen? And I don't, we don't know, but there's a really good book by the late Peter Bloom called Brewing in Detroit. And he speaks of, um, you know, it, it's very possible that they were like, you know what? The demand is being met. We don't need another brewery near Detroit. It's possible. We don't know. Um, however, Mr. Bloom said it's entirely feasible that Henry Ford, a teetotaler, did not want a brewery and distillery basically in his backyard. So there is, there was a meeting on record. There was a meeting between these guys and Ford. No one knows what was said, but the brewery never happened. So I don't want to like start rumors. I, we don't know, but I think it's an interesting theory. And Henry Ford was like, mm -mm, nope, no alcohol. Don't know. Uh, no, a um, little closer to home, Macomb County. So I grew up on the border of Sterling Heights and Troy. My parents got divorced and my mom was in Sterling Heights and still is. And my dad and stepmom are in Troy, still are. <laughs> and so I was back and forth and back and forth and still am. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Macomb County. I did not know, despite living there for many years, that they were known as a spa and resort and retreat town back in the day. Not real conducive to brewing and alcohol, but there were some places um, on a Front Street, a man named William Miller. 1860 to 64, had like a 300 barrel brewery. Good for him. Um, also on Front Street, there was the Clinton River Brewery, August uh, Byer, Byer, you see there, Drink Byer's Beer, the only beer in the city. I don't know if that was true or not, but uh, he was there 1873 until Prohibition. He also had an ice house and a couple saloons. There was the Mount Clemens Brewery. That is uh, that what you see there, kind of a big building there. 1890 to 1935. So they made it through Prohibition to reopen. Didn't last too long after. Um, a Belgian named um, Joseph Oberstadt, and I hope I said that correctly. He was from Belgium. There was a small Belgian community that really supported this brewing company. Uh, apparently there was a tunnel to the Clinton River and you could also age your beer 
in that cool tunnel, made about 6,000 barrels a year. Um, stayed open for most of Prohibition. They made soda pop, near beer, that liquid malt, malt I told, told you about. Uh, they kind of faltered, then reopened in Prohibition, um, but unfortunately they just couldn't quite make enough barrels to stay competitive. Also, there is the Great Baraboo Company, which is still going as far as I know. It was one of the first brewing companies I went to. I had no idea what a brew pub was. And I strutted in there like in 1998 and was like, I'll have a Labatt. And they were like, we don't have that here. And I'm like, we are a bar. And then I think they, anyway, I must've liked it. Cause like, here I am, you know, <laughs> like 25 years later talking about beer. So go Great Baraboo. Um, Oakland County, not a ton of information that I could find. I always say if anyone has information, please reach out, let me know. Um, I do know circa 1872, Milford had a brewery. Um, Jay Breelmeyer had a small brewing operation. He advertised his beer as being strictly pure and healthful. Not uncommon. A lot of people, you know, said, hey, it's healthy. It's vitamin B rich and good for him. Um, Oxford had Finden's Brewery that was advertised as your local party store. And I think they meant party party, not like our party stores that are like convenience stores. Um, apparently you could bring your mug and Mr. Finden would fill it up. Neat little proscript to that. He passed away in 1902, but his widow lived until 1957 and was recorded as Oxford's oldest living citizen passing away at 110 years old, which is pretty impressive. Like I don't, I don't know how accurate they were with like birth records, but we'll give her benefit of the doubt and good for you. Um, Pontiac was really the city where the things were happening. 1850s saw a couple breweries on uh, Saginaw Street. Um, James Carhart opened in the 1870s on Patterson Street. He also was a grocer. Not uncommon again, people often wore those multiple hats. Pontiac Brewing Company was at Patterson Street from 1900 until 1915. And um, that uh, they were one of the ones that um, uh, they went until about right just before Prohibition. Um, they made about 10,000 barrels a year. It's not a small operation. The one that we know a lot about just from finding labels and finding research was the Wolverine Brewing Company on Going Street, not at all related to Ann Arbor's Wolverine Brewing. Um, they were pretty big, 40,000 barrels a year. They uh, won World's Fair um, awards. They based some of the recipes on prior World's Fair winners. They lasted, they managed to make it through. They were another one, made it through Prohibition. Lasted until 43, and it was World War II, kind of like the restrictions and the um, rationing and stuff that really led to their untimely demise. A little more recent, you might remember Big Buck, founded in 1995. I call that this current wave of brew pubs. I talk about it in the book, about how, thanks to a change in the law in 1992, places like Big Buck and Great Baraboo and Arbor Brewing and Grizzly Peak opened up in the mid-90s. Big Buck lasted until 2007. You might remember that giant beer bottle. They still have an operation in Gaylord. I did go to Big Buck once and once again, did not learn my lesson at Great Bear, but I went there on like a blind date and I ordered Labatt. I just don't learn and guy ended up being a loser. So yeah, off, losing all around. Um, just some fun things. If you check out the book, from the library or buy it. You can go to the publisher, Arcadia Publisher, the History Press or Amazon. Um, just some fun things, um, malt liquor, you know, we kind of think of malt liquor is like, oh, malt liquor. But no, when, when it was became popular, it was truly the champagne of beers. I mean, it was lighter and fizzier and some discrepancy on where it got its start. It might've been Minnesota or it might've been in Ionia, Michigan at the Grand Valley Brewing by a very charismatic man, Clix Corbert. You can read about that in the book. Or the Lansing Brewing Company, another very colorful founder, Lawrence Price. I love him. He came here from um, overseas, lands in Pennsylvania, immediately signs up to fight with the Union in the Civil War. He gets like shot in the arm. He's like, whatever, gets up, shot, shot in the hand, whatever, gets up, fights fighting gets shot in the face and they're like Lawrence take a month he took a week got back up joined Sherman and marched across Georgia uh survived the war obviously landed in Lansing made quite a bit of money and was one of the investors founders of Lansing Brewing Company 
Um, there's our Supreme Court, circa 1909. A Eberly Brewing in Jackson filed a lawsuit based around uh, when Jackson went dry. They, it was a little technicality in the law and they got busted and they try, they be, I, I, I have a law degree. I used to do that. And uh, I thought it was interesting, but they end up suing, went all the way to the Supreme Court and you can read about what happened in the book. And just that last picture at my very first presentation, someone in the Q and A said, you know, Patty, if you could go back in time, where would you go drink? And I was like, oh yeah, I know. Anna and Fred Weinman in Lansing, um, 1860s, 70s, had a brewery, a brew, like they had like a beer garden. They had a place where they, they grew cabbage in a garden and then they made sauerkraut, which I don't love, but whatever. They had pigs. They fed the pigs, they spent grain, they killed the pigs, they ate the pigs. Um, and there was an article written that said you could hear lusty Germans singing German drinking songs all night long in the beer garden. And I said, oh my God. That would be so much fun. Like I couldn't vote or wear pants, but I could go and sing with the lusty Germans. So there you go. That's cool. Everything went great until women's seminary school moved in next door. And that was the end of the Weinman's brewery. But man, they had a good run. So good for them. Uh, just currently what's going on in the world of beer it goes without saying COVID. Absolutely. It changed the landscape. Places closed. Um, there were some other issues. People had to pivot on really very short notice to doing carry out and food and all sorts of things. Changed the landscape. Um, not as much as it could have. Thankfully, there was a lot of people survived. Thank goodness. Right now, including the big guys, close to 9,000 breweries in the United States, about 400 brew pubs in Michigan at any given time. Uh, about 24, almost 25 million barrels of beer made in craft beer made in the United States. Um, this made me happy. So I included it that the beer market share actually increased post pandemic. Uh, I was worried about that. And I'm like, oh, no, that's good. It actually went up. So that's good. We do have some issues continuing. Labor shortages are an issue. Um, increasing rents up in um, Bel Air Shorts has actually bought a building and they're offering like lower cost housing to employees, which is cool. Um, ingredients, as you've probably undoubtedly noticed at the grocery store, prices are going up and that absolutely includes brewers. Um, there was concerns about grain with the Ukraine war, Russia invading Ukraine. From what I understand, it is flowing through the Black Sea. Russia has, I don't think they've done anything weird lately, but um, that's still kind of not really sure what's happening with that. Um, so there's some not great news, but the good news is there are new breweries opening all the time. I just read on Facebook, there's one in Northville opening and someone I know who was an owner of Liberty Street in Plymouth is opening a small brewery in Livonia. So that is the really good news. There's cool stuff in the industry happening all the time. So thank you again for jumping on Zoom. I want to thank um, the library again for being so uh, accommodating. And I want to thank Amalia for doing this on virtually. I had an after school thing I had to do and was never going to make it to Rochester in time. So very graciously, she agreed to let me do this on Zoom. So I am going to stop sharing and see if you have any questions I will try to answer. Well, while people are working on their questions, I first want to say thank you so much. What an, a wonderful, informative presentation that you brought thank for us you. today. Thank you. Yeah, quite a, a fascinating history. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put a message in the chat okay. real quick. Um, and while people are working out their questions, um, I have a few just to get you started. Absolutely. Um, so right close to the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned uh, ancient Babylonian beer recipes mm -hmm. that found on the tablets. Has anybody tried to make those? Do you know? That's a really good question. There are some breweries. I know Dogfish Head tried to make one, uh, or they did make one. Dogfish Head is a pretty big brewery out in uh, Delaware. I believe it's Delaware. And they, um, on the East Coast, they did make one. Um, there's other places I know that have tried to like kind of recreate. I think I want to say like, did somebody find an ancient recipe or they found something? They, I know they found like ancient beers and all this stuff and they've tried to like just recreate it. So 
and home brewers, I mean, if you can get your hands on that, that would be a fun little project. Um, speaking of home brewing, do you make your own beer? I did. Um, it is a wonderful hobby. And I have, I don't have the space right now. We're in a condo and I don't have the space. I did for years and years. If you are interested, you will find so many friendly people. Um, I joined the Ann Arbor Brewers Guild and they are just the nicest people. I'm still a member, even though I don't brew anymore. There are just so many resources and people are so willing to share their knowledge about brewing. Um, even professionals, commercial brewers, they're always like sharing and helping people out. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question in the box mm -hmm. from Alex. Mm -hmm. um, we, the question is, what was the change in the law in the mid nineties that you mentioned? Also, he says, thank you for the great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thanks for being here. So um, up until, well, let me back up a little bit. So um, if you, if we were sitting here 40 years and two months ago, we could not just go and I'm sorry, 30 years and two months ago, we could not just get up and go to a tap room brew pub. It was not allowed. The law actually prohibited you from having a brewery and selling the beer on the premises. So there was a guy who owned, I'm sure you probably heard of traffic jam and snug. Um, ben Edwards was a gentleman, a teacher in Detroit. He bought it, bought it in Cass Corridor. And after owning it for a while, he's like, yeah, I, I want to, I'm making cheese and making, I'm going to make beer. So he got like a small operation, was all set to brew. And Michigan is like, no, you can't sell it. You can brew it, but you can't sell it there. And if you want to, or you can like go across the street and buy property and brew it there and bring it across and sell it, but you can't on the same prop. And he's like, oh my God. So by happenstance, there was a, um, uh, there was a man who was a lawyer who was, um, like a regular of the of the traffic jam and they were like okay we got to change this law you got to be brewing beer so they actually challenged the law in federal court suing under the sherman antitrust act uh, unfortunately got kicked out of federal court but that's okay because we also have a state court system so then they sued the crap out of michigan in state court made it to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals said, nah, I think this is something the voters of Michigan should decide on. Let the legislature decide it. Fortunately, we have more than one branch of government and Curtis Hertel Sr. was a representative in Detroit and he was a regular and he introduced in 1990, introduced legislation that says, no, if you, you can brew and sell on the same premises. Um, it got defeated. The Wholesalers Association lobbied really hard against it. So backroom deals, blah, 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 negotiations. And we ended up in 1992, it was December, I think December 18th, where uh, the law became, Public Act 300 became the law. What it did, it created what we call a three-tier system that cut the wholesalers into the equation. So with a three-tier system, if I brew beer, if I have the Patty Smith Brewery and I want to sell it in my brewery, that's cool. But if I want to sell it in the party store or the Rochester Hills Public Library Saloon, I have to have a wholesaler who buys my beer and then resells it for me, but they get the, the money. So it's not a perfect situation, but it did allow the creation of tap rooms. And so that went through in 92 and right away, people started getting licenses and opening tap rooms. So that kind of ushered in that, that wave of beer that we're still riding on. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got a question from James that says, please discuss Bosch beer from South Range in the Keweenaw. Also, how about Yingling, America's oldest brewery? Ah, uh, Yingling, is, yeah, someone, I, I always mean to put them in the slideshow and I keep forgetting. Um, so Bosch, um, that is in the book. I would honestly have to get my book, which unfortunately is not in front of me. Um, it is in the book, the very first chapter is the Upper Peninsula because I feel like I just, I don't know. I, I'm not from there. I just feel like they just kind of always get the short shrift. So I made sure to put their chapter first. Um, there's a cool picture in there. It's uh, when Bosch beer went, they were around for over a hundred years. Great success. There's a picture of the last keg of Bosch beer going to like one of the local saloons in the seventies. And that picture is in the book. So um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have that like right in front of me, but um, I do promise they are in there and they have a nice little section and some nice pictures for that. 
Awesome. All right. Uh, Judith asks, where are you located if someone was interested in having you do your talk for a historic preservation group? Just so oh, I would, I would absolutely love to. Um, if you want to, I, I can put my email in the chat. Um, I'm in Ann Arbor and I'm more than happy. I do, you know, have a small like fee and mileage, but I'm going to put my, put it in the chat. Uh, and I'm also doing, um, if you know about Detroit history tours in Detroit, um, monthly, I'm doing Detroit beer history tours where we take an afternoon and we get on the bus and we go to three different breweries and we do tasting. You're going to hear a lot of this again, but we go to three breweries, you get tastings. It's been a lot of fun. They've my fourth one this Saturday and they've all sold out. So there's none in March, but we're going to start up again in April. We're scheduled through August and we're going to do some beer garden tours this summer too. Love to see you out there. Wonderful. Thank you. I think it's a testament to how fascinating this talk was that people are asking how to I find know, you afterwards. You. <laughs> um, Pedro asks a couple questions. Mm -hmm. How Michigan stands today nationally in craft beer production? Um, is Michigan a good producer of craft beer nationally? And what would be the oldest brewery in Michigan still active today? Let me take the last one first. That's Frankenmuth Brewery. So they started with um, a different, they had a couple different names and then there was like, it got complicated. There was Frankenmuth Brewing Company and Frankenmuth Brewery. And then they, uh, it's all, it's all an, I untangle it in the book. But um, there was a couple of years where there were some ownership changes and then they have a tornado back in the 96, I think, somewhere in 96, I want to say. And, um, but they are credited with being the oldest continuously operating brewery in Michigan. Um, nationwide, I don't have the numbers. We are absolutely very competitive, especially given our size, both population and land mass size. Um, we kind of have everything you need. We have the water. Goes without saying, uh, water, it, it, it can make, I mean, it can make, I've had beer that like, if it's not awesome water, it's not going to be awesome beers. We have that absolutely grow hops. You can grow them in your backyard. You can go up to buy Traverse City. You'll see hop farms all over. Uh, we have the grain. Um, we have, we get straight, you can do wild fermentation if you want, but you also can get yeast strains from all over. Um, and we have a lot of fun adjuncts. As a matter of fact, we did a homegrown festival in Ann Arbor years ago and we had, I ran this little beer festival seeing how many local ingredients you could put in your beer and people put like fruits and then a couple people tried vegetables and then like all this kind of, like they did some needs with honey. Um, so we are absolutely positioned and we are absolutely a competitor. Like I said, I don't know the numbers like in front of me, but um, we're absolutely one of, you know, we're known as the great beer state. It's kind of a marketing thing, but it's also not untrue. I mean, we have the ingredients, we have what you need. We have at any given time, about 400 breweries, again, for our population, population and our size, that's really impressive. Um, and there's, you know, there's new ones all over the place. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question of mm -hmm. my own while people, uh, mm -hmm. while we wait for maybe some last questions mm -hmm. to come in. Um, do you have like a dream beer that you've never been able to try and that you're really, really hoping to try one day? Oh, what a great question. Well, I, um, I don't think I want to go to Oktoberfest in Germany because that sounds a little overwhelming to me, but I would like to go to Germany. Um, I have heard like, it's just, I just heard so many things. I would like to go to Weihenstefan just because it's been, it's so old. Um, I would also, there's a lot of U, UP breweries I've not been to. I've only been up to the UP a few times. And so I would, I went to Black Rocks, which was excellent. Um, I really would love, I don't like to fly, so that's a problem, um, but I could probably be convinced to get on a plane to go to a Germany, go to like a brew, brewing tour and maybe England and Belgium and just check it out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, we'll give it, give it a second, see if anybody has any last questions. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much for coming in, presenting for us tonight. I know that we've yeah. all really enjoyed it. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And anytime, let me know. Yeah. Hopefully do it in person one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If anybody has any last questions, now is the time. Or shoot me an email. I'm happy yeah. to chat. Absolutely. Take, take a picture or copy paste that email right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Amalia. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, everybody else who uh, was able to attend here tonight. Um, we wish everybody a safe and happy night. Um, thank you, Patty. Thank you. Bye. Bye.